And now it's time for another edition of Weirdest Martial Arts Techniques Ever! Welcome, my friends, to Power Rangers Ninja Storm. Go, go, Power Rangers! Hey, remember what I said last time about not wanting to discuss depressing real-world stuff involving Power Rangers actors? <laughs> uh, the Red Ranger of the season, Pua Magasiva, tragically committed suicide in 2019. This is a terrible enough tragedy as it is, but the details are even worse, as revealed later in the year that he had been convicted of domestic assault against his wife, and he was clearly struggling with mental health issues. Like with Ricardo Medina Jr., these things are terrible, and I hate even having to bring them up, but not doing so tends to hang over the video, and it's just bound to happen. When a show has been going on for decades, so many people coming in and out with the rotating casts, there will be some tragedies and terrible things as part of it. But we're not here to dissect real-life things involving the actors, we're here to be glorified Wikipedia, dang it! Let's talk about the show itself, and some of the original plans for Ninja Storm. As I stated at the end of the last video, Disney intended to end Power Rangers and just show reruns for syndication, like many of the shows it had acquired from Saban. However, it was suggested that if production was moved to New Zealand, it would save money while still allowing the show to continue, at least for another season. Before the switch to New Zealand occurred, writer and director Amit Bamak started making plans for something that would be incredibly awesome but also rather fanficy. Bear in mind that some of this information comes from years after the fact, so it's possible the history has been revised a bit as memories change, and creators who have talked about it have become more distant from the original pitches. Bomic's plan has been dubbed the Hexagon. The idea was a large organization or academy uniting various Power Rangers teams together under one central group. The name stems from how the United States has the Pentagon, a five-shaped building that serves as the headquarters of the Department of Defense. In this case, it would be a a six-sided building representing how Power Rangers teams tended to have six members. Essentially, Tommy would return as the head of this Justice League of Power Rangers, or however you want to call it, and it would in turn feature other veteran rangers in supporting cast roles or cameos. Our three new main characters, the Ninja Storm Rangers, would be new recruits sent out on away missions to various locales to fight off new and returning villains, including Prince Gasket, Scorpina, etc. Characters that never really had an on-screen resolution to what happened to them. The Red Ranger would be revealed as the main villain's son and would be turned evil. Keeping with the Sentai footage from the season, Hurricanger, there would be two Rangers who opposed this union, acting as kind of an anti-authoritarian group that didn't want all the Rangers operating under one leader. Instead, that they should be independent groups. And mentored by Jason, apparently. As it happened, this is related to what I talked about in Forever Red. Jason made a remark saying that he recognized some of the Red Rangers, but not others. It's easy to read that line as him referring to to Tommy, but the actual plan was a flashback in this season wherein he had met some of the others. The fighting between the two groups would have forced various ranger teams to pick a side, a civil war between the good guys and never have a united team of rangers. Tommy would have also returned to being the Green Ranger, since the Green Ranger in this season has a very reminiscent suit to the Mighty Morphin outfit though apparently the original notes listed the Green Ranger as a new character altogether, who would act as a deep cover operative depending on which faction he was with at the time. Tommy would have eventually become the main antagonist as he took things too far, and it would end with him seeing the error of his ways and disbanding the Hexagon. The idea was something of a clearing of the deck, end the continuous continuity and baggage from 11 seasons, and let season 12 do whatever it wanted. Much like in space, there were supposedly plans to resolve the Phantom Ranger's identity, where Terra Ventures advanced tech came from when the rest of the world didn't resemble it, a Wild Force team-up featuring Merrick, Zenaku, Jindrax, and Toxica, the former villains now apparently having a traveling carnival. As I said, some of these ideas may have been backfilled and Amit Bomek supplied to fans later, and not actually in the cards at the time. I'm going by what others have chronicled here. Given some of the plot elements that we see in Ninja Storm, this all might have worked. But I'm reluctant to say this was a good idea. From a budget perspective, it would mean tons of guest stars, a lot of original footage, because of course Hurricaneer did not have a bunch of other ranger teams running around in it, and still trying to make all that work with the footage you do have. And frankly, while single anniversary episodes are one thing, bringing in a bunch of past continuity to an audience that may not know what the hell you're talking about is another. Remember that especially back in those days, conventional wisdom about children's shows was that kids will watch it for five years if even 
even that long, and then stop and move on to media more catering to their new age. And we didn't have streaming services or even DVD box sets of entire seasons for people to get caught up if interested in all this history and continuity. Yes, this would have been cool, but it's probably for the best that it didn't happen. So what did happen? Well, as part of moving the show to New Zealand, Disney decided to make the show non-union. Forgive me when it comes to this sort of thing. The show seems to flip-flop a lot on its status of union or non-union production, depending on the season, and I can't always find out which is which. The significance of this, other than Disney being Disney, is that a lot of the production team had to leave the show, including longtime producer Jonathan Zacker. Oh, but we haven't seen the last of him, for better or worse. And because the decision to renew the show happened at a very late point, a lot of the show equipment, props, and costumes had been auctioned off. They did end up saving quite a bit after the renewal, but they still lost plenty, and thus couldn't necessarily recycle as much from previous seasons anyway. Still, despite losing several production people, they were also getting back several production people who had left in earlier seasons. Writers like Jackie Marchand, Doug Sloan, and Ann Austin, with the latter two also becoming producers. Still, the look and sound of the show is noticeably different because of the new production team and equipment. The change in equipment is less evident in this version of the video because I'm using DVD rips that have clearly had everything cleaned up and made better. However, in my original version of this video I made like a decade ago using TV rips, the sound quality was quite frankly garbage. It sounded like the audio was peaking a lot, there was distortion, just noticeably sounded worse than what had come before. If you're paying attention, you can probably still notice, but it's not as frustratingly evident as it was back then. But even in general, colors look a bit more saturated, background noise and sound effects are different, the music is is well, we'll get to that, but the point is that it's very apparent that this was made differently than past seasons. Some eras of television just have a look to them. Cinematography on a popular product tends to get copied and replicated throughout the rest of the industry. Ninja Storm definitely looks more early 2000s in its cinematography than Time Force or Wild Force did. It was apparently a popular misconception that this season was supposed to be completely free of continuity. Ann Austin and Doug Sloan made several comments while the show was being promoted that led people to this conclusion, along with a few lines of dialogue from the first episode. They were quoted as saying things like, It's a new beginning, and Power Rangers lost its luster after we left. The two never actively considered any previous series out of continuity, though, nor did they ever intend to be a series where Power Rangers never happened. Mind you, that dialogue I mentioned doesn't help, but people often need to give first episodes a little more leeway, since ideas and concepts developed for a first episode are sometimes discarded by the end of the series as things change and develop. There's no team-up episode with the Wild Force, Force Rangers, severely disappointing for me, since after what happened in the finale last time, I wanted to see them reclaim their jackets and morphers due to costs and union reasons, which contributed to the feeling that it was a reboot. However, as we'll see next season, Ninja Storm is most definitely a part of the same universe. With the seasons now being filmed in New Zealand, the production team began hiring New Zealand actors. Sometimes it works, other times... Well, other times they try to hide their accents, and it sounds really, really silly. Ironically, because of the violence in the show, Power Rangers was banned from airing in the country at the time. It's a funny old world, isn't it? The season begins with Prelude to a Storm, with a narration that gives away the plot. Including a future spoiler, but I won't talk about that yet. Deep in the mountains, secret ninja academies train our future protectors. It's almost 20 years later with the remake of this video, still waiting on those ninjas to protect us already. Anyway, I can't show the full thing, but this becomes a new standard for almost every future season from here on out. A brief introduction to the plot of the show, even if it doesn't really need it or when it doesn't really apply anymore. For instance, this one mentions three who would become Power Rangers. And then when the amount of rangers on the team expands, it still keeps that intro for the whole series. The theme song... It's hard to say how I feel about it. I never really liked it all that much when I was watching the show, but afterwards I started singing it to myself and listening to it again. There was a great fan edit that made it into a full-length song, and I really enjoy it nowadays. The one weird thing about it, though, is that the first time I heard it, I was reminded of a different song. Yeah. 
The series itself begins where we see our main characters doing EXTREME sports! Tori is surfing, Shane is skateboarding, and Dustin is dirt biking. I should note that this is also the first series to feature only three main rangers to start with, so we're getting something different for this one. And apparently my childhood was very different from a lot of people's. I mentioned at the start of Mighty Morphin Season 2 that dirt bike racing was such an unusual thing to see for teenagers to do, but nope, apparently lots of people did that! I don't know, maybe Minnesota is weird and everywhere else in the United States there are official school teams using four-wheelers and getting in dirt bike races, but it wasn't for me. The three are also already friends and are attendants of the aforementioned Ninja Academy. They decide to talk about how Tori is always the reliable one, whereas they're always late. That groups of people always have different personality types in them, citing the Power Rangers for some reason. Bear in mind that the number of Ranger teams with public identities is pretty low, so I don't know where they got that idea from, that Ranger teams have different personalities unless they knew them already. You guys have to lay off the comic books, seriously. This is the line in particular that made people think this was a reboot. Why cite comic books for the Rangers unless they were fictional here? They reach the Ninja Academy by walking through a forest before getting knocked down by other ninjas and throwing off their clothes. So they were just wearing those heavy black outfits under their casual wear? Ah, and ninjas can run on water because ninjas are magic. Sure, I had some light critique of this in Mighty Morphin Season 3, but let's be real, the ninja powers there are derived from power coins. Of course they had some special abilities that came with them. These are supposed to be normal people, but apparently they have the same abilities as Master Chun from Remo Williams. You must run very fast. Yeah, the three summarily get their asses kicked, despite their Naruto ninja powers. By the way, anyone else seeing the color-coded academy and thinking Slifer Red, Obelisk Blue, Ra Yellow? The three are met by the shape-shifting sensei, Kanoi Watanabe, who says the lesson is over. It, wait, that was it? Maybe you ought to teach them something instead of just throwing ninjas at them. Anyway, he says he's disappointed in them. I will expect a visit from you so that we may discuss your lack of commitment to your ninja training. These sort of situations kind of baffle me. Does this mean that if they had trounced the ones attacking them, he'd be berating said attackers instead? The three enter a magic portal to the Wind Ninja Academy. And yet you fail to see the importance of punctuality. Yes, it's important for them to be on time for them to get their asses kicked. We got a schedule to keep here. So why is this called the Wind Ninja Academy when only one of the rangers will be harnessing the power of air while the other two get different elements? Anyway, we also meet Cam, the sensei's son, who apparently decides to walk around the academy in casual clothes. A portal starts opening up over the academy, Oh god, the time holes from Time Force are back! Quick, somebody start shooting crystals! No, this heralds the return of Lothor, the big bad of the season. The next day, the rangers head out early to be there on time, but they stop to help a couple in distress, much to Shane's irritation. Lothor and his generals arrive at the academy. The dark energy is strong in you. The dark side I sense in you. The generals attack the ninjas with the foot soldiers this season, the Kelzaks, and rain down laser destruction on the academy. While the three proceed on their way to the academy, Lothor and Kanoi begin their battle. One of the generals, Chubo, releases energy spheres that snatch the ninja students and bring them up to Lothor's spaceship in orbit. The three main characters arrive at the academy as the school itself starts dissolving into the sky, leaving them the only remaining students and the area devastated. Lothor, in orbit, berates his nieces, also two generals, because he's evil. Now that the last of the mighty ninja academy has been silenced, the planet is ours. Lothor learns of the three still in the area and dispatches the fourth general, Zergain, to deal with them. Amidst the rubble, they find Cam and make a hasty retreat to a hidden cellar as Lothor's ship resumes firing on the area. There they find Kanoi, but he's been transformed into a CGI guinea pig. Because... Uh... I have no idea. When our energy fields collided, I was transformed into what you see before you. Oh, I see. No, I don't. Never mind. He explains about Lothor, that he was an evil ninja banished from Earth long ago into space. Like, maybe if he was sent to some other magical dimension or something, I'd get it, but like... How did they send him into space? Anyway, he wants to take over the world and he needs to be stopped. Kanoi says to bring out the morphers, much to Cam's irritation. These are your Power Ranger wind morphers. Polish them every day if you want them to keep sparkling like that. Oh, and here's a line that also contributed to the is this season a reboot feeling. I knew it, dude. I was right. 
Power Rangers are real. Again, this season takes place in the main continuity. The same continuity as Countdown to Destruction, as Lightspeed Rescue's team not having secret identities, as every other monster attack in over 10 years. Because we are constantly under attack, this book says that we need people like you. Are the people of the Power Rangers universe just so jaded by the monster attacks that this doesn't make national news anymore? Help! Lieutenant! It's a monster! Kanoi explains their powers, each embodying an element. Though, again, they're not even referred to as the Ninja Storm Rangers here. They're the Wind Power Rangers. So why wasn't this show called Ninja Wind? Does it have any games or what? No, it doesn't have games. but it has Ladies and gentlemen, it has the defenders it? of the galaxy. As a monster comes out with the Kelzaks, the three emerge to fight, morphing for the first time with some... Eh, not great comic relief. Ninja Storm Ranger. Ranger. What is it again? Ninja Storm Ranger form. It's Ranger form. With TV. Be more funny. Well, I guess no one's laughing at the comic book geek now, are they? Yeah, no one should laugh at a comic book geek anyway. It's not like one could ever be funny. After morphing, the theme song kicks in to help sell how awesome this moment is. Sometimes later parts of a season make the same mistake of not using the theme song anymore when the team does something epic, like morphing or summoning Zords. The thing is that even if the theme song isn't that great, it really invokes how cool the thing is. Using the theme song, when it's appropriate, elevates a fight. The editing is kind of weird during the Disney season, Occasionally shots are sped up unnaturally, probably to fit within the time constraints of the episode, but it screws up the pacing of a fight scene. The rangers just somehow know how to use some parts of their powers, like hang gliders that they can summon. Their weapons are a hammer, a hairdryer, and a megaphone. You know, those traditional ninja weapons. Ninjas are apparently anything anyone wants them to be, and yes, I know, fiction, suspension of disbelief, blah 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 blah. Anyway, the visors for the season. Like the Lightspeed Rescue Team, they actually open up, which I like. Sure, I prefer when they take the helmets off, but this is still better than never doing it at all, which is something I don't think either Time Force or Wild Force ever did. Taking off the helmets helps build the idea that the characters are actually inside of the suits, and it's not just random stunt people. Though in the scene immediately afterwards, we see them helmetless, so why even bother then? I like the Ninja Storm suits. The Ninja theme, despite the bright colors, is demonstrated in the overall aesthetic of the design and the addition to the gray areas, which is something the Rangers haven't done before. It gives them their own unique flavor. Anyway, the rangers meet back up in the basement, where Kanoi congratulates them on a job well done. The future is in your hands, Power Rangers. Prelude to a Storm is once again a very fast start to the season. What I think hurts it is that they try to push the inexperienced angle a bit too much. It's one thing to show that these may not be the first and best choices to be rangers, but it's entirely different to show them screwing up with the morphers. The morphing sequence is supposed to be one of those glorious highlights of the first episode, or sometimes second, of the season to show us how cool the team is. Yeah, you can play with it a little after they've morphed, but we shouldn't be seeing them as so incompetent that they can't remember four words that go in rhyme. But then that's the thing with this season. As was pointed out to me after I made the original version of this video, Ninja Storm is more of a comedy than past seasons, and I don't think a lot of the comedy lands. It's not embarrassingly bad most of the time, but I don't think it's as funny as it thinks it is. The Kelzak designs are cool. I like the helmets lacking any real facial features, just the design of a centipede or the like on it, with a close-up on their visors revealing little fastenings along the edge to hold it in place, but it kind of looks like it's stitched on. The same goes for the pattern on their spandex. It looks like stitches or barbed wire. It's like a kid-friendly Cenobite foot soldier. I dig it. So here are some more expositional bits for you. The underground base also serves as a holodeck. Cam is also the one who designs the Zords. Lothor's monsters are referred to as aliens, which are summoned by his niece's cell phone. Worst Tinder date ever. Which also is used to make the aliens grow. Oh, also, Dustin's real name is Waldo. Just wanted to share that. Shane gets the Hawk Zord, Tori gets the Dolphin, and Dustin has the Lion Zord. While they're stored in an underground hangar, they're released via holographic projections. The Lion is actually hidden as a roller coaster. You know, the Dolphin hiding as a boat and the Hawk as a plane makes sense, but the roller coaster? No one's gonna notice a roller coaster in the middle of nowhere. And if it's at a carnival, no one's gonna notice the roller coaster that suddenly vanishes? Or since this is Disney, is it just hidden behind a work wall at one of their parks? They form the Megazord. The design is okay, though the asymmetry of the shoulders is kinda head-tilting and distracting. Weapons for the Megazord are deployed by power spheres, with various different options that can be utilized in toys via discs that they load into the cockpit. Lothar decides to up the ante against our heroes, 
by summoning two rangers of his own. And this is only the second episode, mind you. But who cares about a duo of evil rangers? The Megazord has a lightning mode that lasts 60 seconds and slims down a lot of the extra weight on the Megazord so that it can move faster. One wonders why this isn't the default mode instead of the cumbersome shoulder pads and whatnot. Anyway, in Looming Thunder, we're introduced to Blake and Hunter, adopted brothers who dirt bike on the same track as Dustin. Yeah, they're obviously the two new rangers, the Thunder Rangers. What I like about this is that since Lost Galaxy, every sixth ranger introduced has started as an antagonist to the rangers, both in civilian and morphed forms, to varying degrees, whereas here we get it a little bit different. The two have different personalities, Blake is more friendly and talkative, while Hunter is a little cold and antisocial, and both come off as a little stuck up. But otherwise, they're not considered enemies or jerks right away. The Thunder Rangers themselves loom in the background until the three-parter Thunder Strangers. Zergain recommends they hit the Rangers at the Storm Charger store where they work, but Lothor kicks that plan to the ground. Our Ranger's power can only be destroyed when he's in his full Ranger form. Wait, you can only destroy them when they're at their most powerful? I mean, you could just shoot them in the head when they're in civilian mode. I mean, come on, the series is already making up crap about ninjas, so stop pretending there's some deep philosophical reason why the rangers can't be attacked in their civilian forms. Otherwise, why do you keep sending Kelzaks down to attack them? This, I think, is one of the attempts by the show's writers to make this show a bit more comedic than previous ones, but it's not silly enough to work like that. It comes across as a serious explanation for something that we've just kind of accepted at this point after 11 seasons. The Thunder Rangers finally make their attack on the three. Our hero's aren't even shocked by these two appearing, it's weird. After kicking the three around for a bit, the Thunder Rangers inexplicably decide to leave. The Sensei says their fighting style matches those of the Thunder Ninja Academy, something confusing to the Rangers since they thought Lothor had captured all of the Ninja Academies. Is it just me, or does it seem weird at all that there are multiple academies that train apparently hundreds of students, and yet no one has heard about this until now? There are never any bitter dropouts or the like. And how useful are these ninja academies for defending the Earth if a single villain is able to take them all down this quickly? They had one job! The sensei does say that they're not being mind-controlled, and they're equally confused about why the Thunder Rangers didn't finish them off. Later, Zergain tries to finish off the Rangers himself, but Lothor recalls him because... Uh... He's an idiot. The Thunder Rangers attack again, this time equipped with motorcycles, the same kind that Cam designed for the Ninja Storm Rangers, thanks to a disc stolen off of Dustin, as well as their own Zords. The Insectazord and Beetle Zords are pretty cool, with cloaking devices as well as tank-style weaponry. Of course, the two can form their own Thunder Megazord, and the two giant machines rumble. The battle's actually pretty damn good, but things turn bad for our heroes when Cam tries to send them a new weapon and the Thunder Rangers intercept it and take it for their own Megazord. After disabling the Ninja Storm Megazord, they once again retreat, the Rangers left in their trashed cockpits. At this point, there's sadly something else I must comment on here, and that's the music. Ninja Storm, while containing more guitar and rock tracks for the show, sadly does not use them appropriately. The background music feels like it's placed at random at times and doesn't actually match the action. By Time Force and Wild Force, the synth stuff was actually getting pretty good and particular tracks were very well produced. Here though, it's just constant, fast-paced music and it really hurts the tone. What's made worse is that apparently the producers just love stock music. Public domain music tracks that are very recognizable if you've seen cheap movies before. Some very noticeable and kind of cliched tracks. You're not gonna step on my party! I'm gonna wipe you out, Toe Jam! Can you do this? Ninja Power! However, for the first confrontation with the Thunder Rangers, the music guys added a nice little 80s synth strike to the music that helped punctuate the danger these guys represented. Part 2 begins with the Rangers discovering that their morphers are trashed as well. Oh, and Cam finds a way to be a dick about it. Well, you've managed to reduce years of technological advance into a pile of scrap metal in a single afternoon. Thanks, Cam. I'm sure it's their fault a bunch of evil Rangers came to kick their asses. Fortunately, Cam has equipped the Zords with systems that will automatically repair themselves, but it was still a pretty damaging 
damaging blow both for their tech and their morale. The sensei believes that there's dissension among their little evil alliance and they can take advantage of it later. The rangers are feeling down about the loss, though really it's only Tori who's given anything to work with with it. I hate to keep comparing it to this, but the Green Ranger saga handled this expertly, with the music underscoring the tension and helping to build up the mystery and threat presented by an evil ranger. Instead, we've got a loud, rockin' soundtrack while Dustin and Shane are talking. Dude, you've changed it over like four times already. And say, what's the best way to downplay the threat of your main villain? How about you have a scene where his niece is painting his nails? Blake shows up and rescues Tori from an attacking monster. Does Tori not wonder why he was riding his motorcycle near the lake while he was in full riding gear? Taking a full hit from it. Tori brings Blake back to right outside Ninja Ops to try to help him. While he's supposedly unconscious, he sees Tori going into the hidden entrance. After defeating the monster, the three return to Ninja Ops to discover the Thunder Rangers already there. They demorph and reveal themselves, though the three show no reaction to this news whatsoever. They wish the Ranger's luck and kidnap the Sensei, ending part two. Part three begins with a celebration on board Lothor's ship, with everybody dancing. But you're not even gonna take over a juice bar to celebrate your conquest of Earth? All right, all you've done is kidnap a guinea pig. Truly, Lothor is an evil mastermind. Yeah, I really don't like Lothor. He reminds me of the criticisms made against Lord Zed as Mighty Morphin went on, being hammier, cracking jokes, acting like an idiot. And while I mostly disagreed with that assessment of him, Lothor embodies it. I know, the season is more comedic, but the plot is still set up like a traditional Power Rangers one, so I'm continually left wondering why the Rangers are having such a problem dealing with this doofus. Zergain would have made a better main villain, honestly, and he's sponsored by Monster Energy. The group tracks the Sensei to where the Thunder Rangers are taking him, the Mountain of Lost Ninjas, where it's said to have ninja ghosts and a cavern where they can break the energy orb that's currently protecting him. The ninjas talk with their captive guinea pig and exposit that he killed their adoptive parents. They run into ninja ghosts, allowing the Wind Rangers to catch up. The two groups call a temporary truce to fight off said ninja ghosts, but once they're defeated, Zergain suddenly appears with his own Zord. Tori stays behind to fight him alone with the Megazord, while the other two chase after the Thunder Rangers. Tori defeats Zergain with power spheres that come out of nowhere, but the Thunder Rangers get to the cavern first. The three get to them before they kill the Sensei, and the Thunder Rangers say it was Lothor who told them about what happened to their parents. You know, the villain who kidnapped all the other ninja students and plans to take over the world. Real trustworthy source there, guys. However, the ghosts of said parents appear and reveal that Lothor was responsible. Lothor shows up, but before he can take the sensei himself, Hunter blocks his blast using the Gem of Souls, the crystal they were gonna use to kill the sensei. With the revelation of what happened, Blake and Hunter depart. Following that, we get a good filler episode that has great character development for Cam. We learn that he resents the fact that he didn't get chosen as a ranger. The sensei explains that the reason why is because he made a promise after his mother died to not allow him to be put into the dangerous light of a ranger. With two fillers out of the way, the story continued in the four-part Return of Thunder. Tori, deciding she misses Blake, borrows Dustin's bike and heads out searching for him. Meanwhile, Blake and Hunter are contacted by Chubo, one of Lothor's aforementioned comic relief generals, who tells them that he wants to defect. Blake lets the rangers know about the apparent defection, and they decide to check it out by trying to sneak onto Lothor's ship. If they can get in and out without difficulty, they'll call in the other rangers for backup. It is, of course, a trap, and the two are recaptured by the villains. This was a stupid plan already. Why not have him smuggle a bomb on board to prove his defection instead of yourselves where you'll be trapped? But on top of them believing Lothor about what happened to their parents, it kind of makes me wonder how they were so effective against our heroes before. Anyway, the villains brainwash the two so they'll work for Lothor again. After a monster fight, Chubo teleports all five to another dimension with a single small island in it. Part two begins with a weather disturbance hitting the city, lowering the temperature drastically, a result of the dimensional shift. While on the other world, the two teams have a pretty decent unmorphed fight before morphing to continue things. The more they fight, the more that the two start to regain their own memories. They blast the two again Again, but Hunter takes the brunt of it, turning on his brother and the other rangers again. Blake rejoins the Wind Rangers while Hunter gets hit with some sort of toxic stream that drives him even crazier, ending part two. Blake tells the three how they became rangers, raised by the Thunder Academy after their parents died. When Lothor attacked, their sensei gave them their morphers, and in turn the two were captured. Does make me wonder if the other ninja academies had morpher technology behind them, because we never see that. Lothor then told them to lie about their parents' death, and we saw how that played out. Hunter and Blake and engage one another, and with the power of sepia tones and flashbacks, they manage to restore him to normal. Do you know who we are? Yeah. 
my friends. Cam manages to finally get in touch with the Rangers and dispatches the Zords to pick them up. As punishment for his failure, Chubo is banished from Lothor's court. Meanwhile, Hunter and Blake are hired to be stock boys at Storm Chargers. I was going to say the name of the woman who owns Storm Chargers is Kelly, but then I realized that she has no bearing on anything really in the season other than, you know, non-Ranger related stuff. Part 4 feels arbitrarily tacked on and feels more like an epilogue episode than part of the previous three. Chubo goes after the Thunder Rangers as revenge, and the five defeat him by combining their Megazords into the Ninja Thunder Megazord. Because of course, the only thing cooler than one giant robot is two giant robots merged into one bigger giant robot and with ninjas. To be perfectly honest, I actually liked Return of Thunder a lot more than Thunder Strangers. It was a much tighter story, and the action was well put together. Thunder Strangers tried to do a lot in too little amount of time. There isn't a very good reason why they even fight the Rangers at all if their goal was the Sensei the entire time, and why they'd trust Lothor is never really explained. The resolution of the story happened far too quickly and lacked a lot of emotional resonance when we hadn't even seen a picture of their parents. Return of Thunder worked to give us backstory, good fights, and overall a more enjoyable series of episodes. On the other hand, there's another problem with this stuff in that it introduced the rival rangers a bit quickly. It's of course tradition in the series to have a sixth ranger, or at least a separate one from the main team, but usually they're introduced around a fourth of the way into the season, whereas in this case, they started almost immediately, not really giving the show a chance to experiment with the three ranger concept for very long. For that matter, having the rangers fight more than one evil ranger could have probably lasted a lot longer than it ended up being. Still, I do understand that they're confined by the Sentai footage. Following two more fillers, another three-parter hits. The Samurai's Journey. Cam once again demonstrates his martial arts prowess as well as his resentment over not being a ranger, even if the team relies on him for his technology. Everything we're able to do is because of what you're able to do. It's not enough. I want to be part of it. At the end of Tori and Cam's talk, a monster appears, in a really good transition, and the six fight. Cam is held back by the Kelzaks, while the Rangers' powers are drained by the monster. The Rangers try to go out, and Cam gives them a temporary power increase so they can fight, even if it's only for a little while. The battle goes well for a bit, but after a Megazord fight, the five are out of energy. While they retrieve the sphere that contains their powers, they can't open it without something stronger. The Sensei says there may be a way to help them, a power source in the distant past, but he's reluctant to share more. Cam realizes what the power source is and engages the Scroll of Time, which allows him to time travel into the past. While the portal is open, time in the present is frozen, save for Lothor's ship apparently, but the portal is also temporary, so Cam needs to be quick about his journey. Even though, like, he's in the past. Why would the relative time he's there make a difference when the Earth itself is frozen in time? But then why would Lothor's ship be unaffected and- I hate temporal mechanics. Cam arrives in the past and finds the younger version of his father. He also runs into his mother, who was the first female student at the Ninja Academy, and trained in the art of samurai combat. Despite samurais being an entirely different thing from ninjas. This is like joining the navy and learning how to drive a tank. Anyway, she has a pendant that's wanted by his uncle, who in turn turns out to be studying dark magics. After an awesome fight between Cam and the brother, Kia, Cam unlocks the power of the amulet and stops him. Kia, in turn, is banished. From this point forward, I will be known as Lothor! No! Cam, not being stupid, tries to tell them to destroy Lothor instead of banishing him, but he needs to return to the future due to dramatic convenience. Cam returns to the present not only with a new outfit, but also a new Zord as the Green Samurai Ranger. Oh, yeah. So where the heck did he get that thing anyway? But yeah, the Samurai Star Megazord is awesome, and even has a weapon made of a giant bee. My god. However, Lothor shows up to attack them with his nieces and Kelzax in tow. Before he can fight them, the Sensei teleports the Six back to Ninja Ops, courtesy of a new teleportation system Cam developed. With the Six Rangers together, they open the sphere and restore everyone's powers. The Sensei explains that once a ninja is banished, they cease to exist, so Lothor isn't considered part of the family tree anymore. Seems more than a bit convenient to rob any of the emotional impact of this, but whatever. Lothor unleashes six monsters, forcing the Rangers to split up to deal with each one. To pad the story out in the most ridiculous manner possible, Cam is bitten by the insect monster and starts turning into a bug. I can't believe 
that in my first ranger battle, I practically get turned into a bug. Neither can I. It's a seriously rushed thing to do, considering it happened with only about 10 minutes left in the episode. And remember, this is part three of this three-parter. Still, in the follow-up battle, we see that he has a super samurai mode where he ditches the shield and his helmet spins around. I should also note that all through this story, the villains have been engaged in comic relief antics. Sometimes it works, but most of the time it really feels out of place with the drama with Cam. Still, the episode ends well. You gotta be part of the team. You gotta have the gear. Congratulations. No father could be prouder of his son. This is about where I talk about the team-up episode, but sadly, as I said, there is no team-up episode for this season. There are plenty of good story opportunities for it, too. Jindrax and Toxica still being around opened up plenty of potential for follow-up. Still, I suppose with Disney watching the budget more and the entire change in continent where filming was taking place, it would have probably been difficult to get them all together again, even if there weren't union issues on top of everything else. Anyway, with Cam's new duties as a ranger, he creates a holographic construct of himself to work at Ninja Ops. For some reason, Cam programmed him to be completely obnoxious. Oh, yeah, and speaking of obnoxious, in a filler episode, Chubo gets restored because there wasn't enough comic relief villainy on board Lothor's ship. Shane gets his battleizer in a unique way this season. Instead of it being a one-episode, introduced the last minute kind of deal, Shane assists an alien woman named Skyla in a two-parter called Shane's Karma. The woman's species passes on their life force to another being when they start to die, and she's chosen Shane. Her power manifests in a very simple armored form that allows Shane to be quicker and stronger. Probably the most streamlined and best-looking battleizer so far, though it does have a flight mode that adds wings. In the same episode, Lothor hires a bounty hunter named Vexicus to join up as one of his generals. Oh yeah, and at the end of another two-parter, Cam unlocks the Ancient Ninja Electric Guitar! I'm not kidding! Who knew ancient ninjas were fans of wild stallions? Excellent! <laughs> now, some of you are already getting ready to type out, but that's not a guitar, it's a shamisen. And you'd be absolutely right, but that's not how they present it, because Power Rangers. Its official name is the Lightning Riff Blaster, and the music it makes sounds like an electric guitar. Don't blame me, I'm not responsible for the Americanization of Japanese stuff in Power Rangers. With, of course, the irony being that it's Americanization happening in New Zealand. And thus, with the ancient ninja electric guitar, they unlock the Mammoth Zord, which is kind of the Titanus for this season. The two-parter adds yet another general to the mix, an ancient warlord named Shimazu, and a robotic general named Motodrone. And of course, near the end of the series, we get the Hurricane Megazord, mixing all three Megazords together, and I do have to say that it's cool to finally see all six rangers in the same cockpit, since all season they've been separated. And of course, just to add to the coolness, the Hurricane Megazord's final attack is a big tornado. The season starts drawing to a close with the two-parter General Deception. After a prolonged battle with the rangers, Zergane is killed by Vexicus as part of a plan to usurp Lothor's armies. A surprising development occurs in A Gem of a Day, the episode right afterwards. The Sensei decides it's time to finally rescue the captured ninjas and bolster their forces to fight proactively against Lothor. It's so rare to see the heroes being proactive in Power Rangers that it's shocking when it happens. Anyway, Hunter kept part of the crystal that was going to be used against the Sensei, hoping to contact his parents' ghosts, but gives the fragments to Cam so he can use them to get to Lothor's ship. Cam takes a new Zord up to Lothor's ship the Dragon Force vehicle. And good thing he named it Dragon Force and not Dragon Sound. We know their position in this war. Cam makes it to the students, but Lothor intercepts him with a squad of Kelzaks and can't reach them. Motodrone is destroyed by Vexicus before he can alert Lothor of the plans the general has against him. Meanwhile, Lothor's nieces destroy Shimazu when he insults them and reveals that they're working with Vexicus. Farewell, Shimatsu and Motodrone. You were hardly worth mentioning. The season comes to a close, and the two-parter storm before the calm. However, in a double switch, it turns out the nieces are really working for Lothor, who has known all along his generals would be destroyed thanks to the Scroll of Destiny, prophetic texts that have revealed everything that has happened in the plot up to this point, save for the missing end of the scroll. Lothor's nieces disable the Samurai Star Megazord while the Thunder Rangers destroy Vex, Mexicus, but at the cost of their Zords. Lothor infects Cybercam with a virus that allows him access to ninja ops. But is it so wrong to dream of a world where the ultimate evil rules over all those who inhabit it? Yes. 
The nieces proceed to wreck ninja ops while Cam and the sensei fight Lothor. It's a pretty impressive fight and surprisingly fast paced considering Lothor's costume has to be a little bulky. With Ninja Ops destroyed, Lothor blasts the Sensei away and kidnaps Cam, ending part one. The Sensei is restored to his human form, because magic, and he explains that Lothor plans to open a portal to the Abyss of Evil with Cam's powers, allowing an army of evil forces to sweep over the Earth. Lothor turns on his nieces, thinking their newfound evil means that they'll eventually betray him later. Blake and Hunter head out in the Dragon Force vehicle to Lothor's ship to once again try to free the ninjas, to strike at the villains, if you will. Back in the remains of Ninja Ops, the three lament their situation, thinking that if they had been on time that day this all started, they would never have been rangers. You were always meant to be rangers. Turns out he has the last piece of the Scroll of Destiny, which reveals crude drawings of the three. And this was the thing that was mentioned at the beginning of every episode of the show, so why did you wait until now for this? While the scroll doesn't reveal who's going to win in the end, it does give the three some hope that they're the right ones for the job. While Lothar heads out in a new Zord to finish opening the portal, Blake and Hunter head through Lothar's ship for Cam and the ninjas. To make matters worse, Lothar has set his ship to self-destruct. Cam says they have to rescue the nieces, since they're family to him. Yeah, who? was their parent exactly? The ninja students are freed and all the rangers beat a hasty retreat thanks to Cam's teleport as Lothor's ship blows up. The other rangers manage to destroy Lothor's zord at the cost of their own megazord, the release of power allowing the portal to open and release dozens of formerly dead monsters. The three fight valiantly until the arrival of the thunder rangers and a squad of ninja academy students. It's an all-out battle royale as they have to send all the monsters back into the portal. Lothor destroys Shane's battleizer and takes on all five at once, easily sweeping through them. With Cam's Samurai Morpher, Lothor absorbs all their powers, but the rangers fight on anyway. I have your ranger powers. We may not be power rangers, but we still have power. Using their ninja magic to summon elemental forces, Lothor is blasted into the abyss. It closes and the day is saved. Ladies and gentlemen and others, the Defenders of the Galaxy. Our heroes have lost their ranger powers, but hey, at least they got to keep their jackets. The group is awarded graduation of the Ninja Academy, with some going their separate ways in their personal lives, but for Tori, Dustin, and Shane, they're gonna stick around to teach the next generation at the Academy, which includes Lothor's nieces. A happy ending is nothing more than a new beginning. Besides, one should never break up a winning team. Ninja Storm is very much akin to Lightspeed in that it's a decent series, but a lot is holding it back. When it's good, it's really good, but when it's bad, it's painful. It struggled with multi-parters often wrapping up the main plotline fairly early, and then having something tacked on at the end or an additional entire episode when it shouldn't have been. It feels like they could have padded out the episode to the proper length with character development, but no, let's turn Cam into a bug for 10 minutes. Often the stock music didn't help, but like the synthesizer music, it's something you got used to. And like Lightspeed, the villains are really kind of lame. Lothor is terrible. He's basically a male Divatox. His plans are moronic, he's easily distracted, and he never inspires fear when you look at him, but laughter. This is the guy that's supposed to be trying to take over the world. Our final boss. Someone we have to seriously believe is a threat to the Rangers. However, his demeanor never makes me think of him as someone to be fearful of, but more like a frustrated guy having to babysit his teenage nieces. Would you get that stupid thing off your face? You look like a luchador who used the wrong material for his mask. Having a comedic main villain is okay sometimes, but when the main characters are supposed to be afraid of him, it just creates a weird paradox that makes him look completely incompetent. Think back to Lord Zed. He had his moments of humor, but his eye was always on the ball of conquest, and the humor was more derived from his rage and incompetence. A lot of the time, Lothor seems perfectly content about his current situation and not owning the planet. Really, why does he even want to conquer the world? You don't want to take over the universe, do you? No. You wouldn't know what to do with it. Beyond shout at it. For crying out loud, in one episode he gets upset that he doesn't get invited to an environmental conference. What the hell does he care about an environmental conference that even the news admits only has representatives from its own city that are only concerned about the environment in its own city? And yes, I know, originally it was a peace conference, but that still doesn't make any sense. Not even in the final episode did I ever see Lothor as a threat to the world. 
He was actually doing major ass kicking, but it's more like when Princess Shayla was doing martial arts. The result is more bafflement than excitement. You can claim his plan all along was based on the scroll, but if that was the case, why did he even care whenever he failed? Zergane would have made a much better main villain. He was serious-minded, always devoted to the job, and his plans were the ones that tended to come closer to success than any of the others. I felt bad for the guy, since he was the only one who was actually trying to do the job correctly, yet he's held back by the incompetence of his peers. Another thing that bugs me about the villains this season is simply the visual aesthetic. If you consider previous bad guys, they tended to have consistent color schemes and looks with detailing only when necessary. For example, Lord Zed is basically two colors, red and silver. Trakina, Rancic, and Astronoma have a black and silver color scheme, Astronoma's hair notwithstanding, but Lothor, his generals, the interior of his ship, and even the monsters have far too many colors and little details everywhere. It's like having a sleek black car but then shoving about a hundred different stickers on it with no rhyme or reason with the placement. It's ugly and not interesting to look at. The visuals are just too busy. This season, though, does have its strong points. Thematically, there's an undercurrent of family for most of the characters. Cam is consistently worried about his father and the state he's in as a guinea pig, who in turn is a devoted father who wants to protect his son from the potential problems of being a ranger. Blake and Hunter are brothers who are motivated by the loss of their own parents, and ultimately Hunter is rescued from evil through their connection. Even Lothor, despite his actions in the last episode, seemed to have a soft spot for his nieces, letting them get away with far more than I would if I was in his position. Speaking of family, let's talk about Shane. He has trouble working on a team, both early on as well as with Hunter when he joins up. He's probably the most serious member of the team, but we learn in a filler episode why that is. While one might assume he's only interested in his skateboarding, we learn that his family puts enormous pressure on him to take his life seriously, to work on getting a job and worry about his future and the responsibilities he needs to be embracing. What people don't realize is that he does know what's important, both for his future and where he is now, it's just when one has the fate of the world on your shoulders, you need to find ways of keeping your sanity in check, like through a sport. His older brother, a businessman, discovers his double life as a ranger, and instead of being a jerk or something about it like some TV shows would, he instantly understands and wants to help him. I don't know why I like that so much, but I do. Blake, I have to say, is not given much to do. Aside from his motivation and whatnot, it seemed the biggest factor of his character was his budding relationship with Tori. Nothing seemed to come from it, but clearly there was an attraction between the two. Like I said, the character was just average and there. Hunter is a little more standoffish than his brother and needed more time to be social, though he assumed the same level of blandness eventually. However, there is a gradual development that we see, where when he's first introduced, he's kind of rude. Uh, we come down from... You wouldn't have heard of it. Easy, bro. Anyone is why we don't have any friends. Yet later, there's a specific thing that he refers to his fellow rangers as when he's freed from Lothor. Do you know who we are? Yeah. My friends. Dustin is a very trusting nature, which gets him in trouble more than once. He's instantly friendly with people, but as a result doesn't think too far ahead about the consequences of his actions. It leads to him being a little vain at times, but in the end his heart is in the right place. He's kind of the doofier member of the team, cracking dumb jokes and getting lost about what's going on, but again, he's still a good guy and isn't selfish. There was a subplot I didn't mention in the main recap about how Dustin was kind of getting into a relationship with one of Lothor's nieces, but... I didn't think it was going anywhere because she admitted to lying about the whole thing in the episode it was initially featured, but it was brought up again later, particularly at the end. Tori is probably the most competent fighter and most well-rounded person, but like the Thunder Rangers, it makes for someone who feels very generic and without personality quirks. She does get a very interesting episode later in the series where she's transported into a parallel universe where the Rangers are evil and Lothor and his generals are the good guys, and she gladly stands and fights against the evil versions, despite her inability to morph. That's pretty much it, though, and while the episode is interesting, it's not as well-developed as it should have been. We did get to see early on that Cam had Mark martial arts training, plus his resentment over not being a ranger and feeling like he lacks respect makes him a bit more complex. He reminds me a lot of Billy during Zeo, a tech geek who could do so much more for the team, but lacks the power to make it happen. I have to say, I found him to be my favorite character despite how rude he started off as. His desire to help the team was selfless, and his quest to find the samurai powers, at least the first two and a half parts of it, were the best episodes of the season, especially when you see him meeting the younger version of his mother. The sensei is one of the weirdest and dumbest mentors ever. The problem is that if you don't actually have anything wise to write into the script, then don't try to play it up as wisdom, because otherwise you get really, really dumb lines like these. One who is lost in thought is still lost, son. Yes. 
I'm lost. Remember, Tori, a conclusion is simply the place where you got tired of thinking. It's totally inapplicable to anything that's going on here. And it's dumb. But using your range of powers in everyday situations can have serious consequences. The best part about that example is he's referring to when Dustin stops professionally hired goons from trashing a store, i.e. committing a crime. Are vandals an everyday situation in the sensei's mind? I must use my telepathic ninja powers to break his hold on them. This season tries to play things a bit more tongue-in-cheek than previous seasons and... I'm sorry, to some people that's great, but as I've said before, this is a biased perspective, and I'm giving my own opinion here. I don't like it. Don't get me wrong, part of the appeal of Power Rangers is the cheesiness of it, and I do like self-referential lines on occasion. However, most of the jokes aren't funny, and this is the season where we really started playing up said bad jokes from the Rangers during fights. They just distract from the action. Lothor's antics can get pretty intolerable, especially when he's supposed to be this big bad alien conqueror. What happened to him in the depths of space that made him this way? When Cam visited the past, Keo was serious and pretty damn cool. However, somehow while he was exiled, he turned into a goofball. There's just a lot of tonal whiplash that keeps me from enjoying it. Overall, Ninja Storm is flawed. Like I said, there are a lot of things to like about it, and several episodes I do recommend. It's certainly not the worst season, far from it, and I know it has a lot of fans, but I don't think it was a good first outing for Disney's management of the show. However, there is a light in the distance for Disney's next season, Power Rangers Dino Thunder. season. Hello my friends, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching!